-hmm. But it is allowing, yeah, now participants are starting to come in. So by my uh, my picture is not yet moving, right? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Just uh, take off the video. And start again. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 There is echo. Yeah. Yeah. Down. 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 All right. Now. Yeah. So well, welcome uh, everybody. Hope you hear me well. Uh, my name is Emanuele. Emanuele Emilia. I work at BSC since. Uh, some months, and I'm in charge of uh, coordinating the Barcelona Dust Regional Center. So I I would like to to welcome everybody for a special webinar session. So it's uh, as some of you already know, today is the International Day of Combating Sand and Dust Storms, and we we will discuss uh, about this. So I always uh, uh, wonder how, how all these days are chosen and the date that is, is given by the United Nations. And uh, there are more than 100 uh, of that, of course. So we, we, we can be happy, happy about the fact that uh, on 12 July is, is the only international day for, for sun, uh, sun and dust storm. So let's, uh, let's try to move to the next slide and uh, uh, kick off this, the celebration with some uh, nice pictures. So uh, it, it seems that uh, on the exact uh, day of 12 July in 2023, uh, nature uh, kicked off the, the celebration with a dust uh, event in the Western Mediterranean. And uh, you, you can see here uh, some picture that I could uh, find in previous days. So, uh, and also will help me to introduce to the sessions. So first on the bottom, you see measurements uh, from uh, MODIS imagery, and uh, there is this brown uh, that you can probably identify. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. And uh, on the top, you see that with modeling uh, tools that you already, or, or today we can produce operationally every day, we already see some uh, clearer picture of the aerosol optical depth uh, mo moving through the Mediterranean region. Oh. And uh, modeling is also a, a part of the presentation. Then if we move to the bottom, this is the air quality uh, forecast from the Copernicus uh, uh, air quality services of ground concentration of particulate matter. And uh, this is of concern for health. And uh, you can see that the, during these days, we have a very high load of PM10 here in Spain especially. So finally, uh, I, I wanted to highlight that, uh, unfortunately, in this day, there is also an extreme event of high temperature. So you have, you have here on the top, on the right, the um, uh, maximum daily temperature uh, forecast, extreme forecast index from East WF. Unfortunately, that cannot uh, fix uh, uh, the climate change uh, issue that we face today. But still, there is an important impact on radiation, and uh, the, there will be a dedicated session uh, on that as well, with uh, many important applications for solar radiation and aerosol. So next slide. So to, I, I'll just resume briefly the agenda of the day. So the, in the beginning, we, we welcome Sarah Bazar from WMO and Slobodan Nigovic 
from the Republic Dermatological Service of Serbia that will give you a, um, uh, an introduction on impacts on the reason of this day and uh, historical introduction to the establishment of the of the services that we will be we have been exploring. Um, then there will be a main session uh, that goes from science to services uh, with many uh, speakers that will be uh, presented uh, more in details uh, uh, each time. And we'll finish by looking at the future and what are the challenges and emerging topics of this day. Uh, and with some ending with some question from uh, 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 handled by Mark Parrington of the SMWF. So last but not least, uh, let me first introduce you the moderators that will help uh, to uh, keep this uh, session on schedule. So it will be Ernest Werner from the Spanish Meteorological Agency. So please, Ernest, uh, go on and enjoy the webinar. So Sarah, is, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I, uh, you don't need presentation, so those the introduction for you. Oh, yes, but we have now Dr. Sara Bazar. This is uh, from uh, the science officer of the WMO. Uh, it's our focal point of uh, uh, some of the system. So, Sara, go ahead. Thank you, Ernest. Yeah, you know uh, me very well because I was in the Barcelona the Regional Center before to write this year at WMO, which is the World Meteorological Organization. And why? So, today we are celebrating this International Day. It's basically if you go next, please. Because as you know, sun and dust storms has become a serious global concern in the recent decades due to their significant impact in human health, livestock, agriculture, but also socioeconomic sectors. And particular key in sun and dust storms related is energy connected with solar energy and transportation, meaning ground transportation, but also aviation. And this is a nice uh, figure that maybe you see regularly in my presentation sometimes, in which is really explained that the impact is not uh, limited to weather and climate. It's this component on society that is taking a lot of attention from the society at large. If you go next, please. Then what is happening today is that basically WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, welcomes the new United Nations General Assembly resolution that is establishing today, 12th July, as the International Day of Combating Sun and Dust Storms. Basically, this, re this resolution recognizes that sun and dust storms are issues of international concern that is negatively affecting the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. In fact, uh, sun and dust storm is connected with 11 over the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, but the reason is gathering also attention at the uh, UN level, and also is because this concerns that United Nations launched in 2018 the Coalition for Combating Sun and Dust Storms. Basically, this coalition is a group of 15 UN agencies that are working to support implementation of strategies for mitigating and, ad and adapt the public population to these uh, uh, hazards. If you go next, please. And why we need this international collaboration? Because as you know, desert dust transport is a global phenomenon. In the images, you can see landscapes from Europe that are heated by Saharan dust events, and sometimes are very extreme events that are causing some real impacts in, in our daily life. And it's because the occurrence of these extreme events that the resolution stressed this need for global and regional cooperation to manage and mitigate, mitigate the effects of sand and dust storms. If you go next, please. Then here is when WMO starts to be a player because WMO is committed to promote international coordination to tackle this major hazard. And for the reason WMO established in 2007, the San Andreas Storms Research Program, call it San Andreas Storm Warming Advisory and Assessment System, which is the SDS Worst. And it's basically, the SDS was is basically an international partnership between scientists, operational centers, and stakeholders that we are searching to improve the access to the, the uh, that's information that is uh, available and to give access to this information to any kind of user. Then now with this introduction, it's my pleasure to give the floor.
floor to the Slobodan Nikovic, that who was one of the most important players in the creation of this San Andreas Storm program at W. Me too. Yes, thank you for your kind words. Uh, and uh, I think we can just start with my presentation. So uh, the SDS sand and dust storms uh, are of uh, concern uh, of the societies uh, over decades and uh, centuries. Uh, and here are some examples uh, of ancient, ancient dust recording, for example, in Korea uh, before the Christ time. And uh, you can see uh, from, on this image that uh, recording was not just uh, uh, limited to uh, time and and the location, but also on uh, some impacts uh, to the society. Similar records you can find also in the ancient records of uh, Japan and Korea as well. On the left hand side, this is interesting painting from uh, George Francis, uh, uh, who uh, painted, who, who represented the dust storm in Sahara. And interestingly, in the lower part of the painting, there are some few people uh, uh, praying to the God to be saved under these harsh conditions. Hopefully, today we have some better means, uh, like uh, to predict uh, the events and uh, indicate uh, to the society how to protect uh, from from uh, uh, bad uh, uh, implementation, or bad uh, impact of, of dust. Uh, next, please. So here are some examples of uh, historical uh, records. Uh, now this is uh, 18th uh, and 20th century, uh, 19th, 18th and 20th century, where, where some scientists, scientists started to make scientific records. Uh, and here this uh, Charles Darwin uh, example of Beagle Cruz dust samples. And interestingly, in uh, 19. Uh, 22 uh, Richardson, who is the, the father of uh, numerical weather prediction concept, insisted that in addition to temperature, wind, uh, humidity, we should introduce the atmospheric dust uh, into our numerical weather prediction uh, uh, systems. Uh, 70 years after, we uh, really uh, managed to, to do this. And here are another some examples. In the uh, uh, 1980s, 70s, and 80s, uh, Bob Deuce and uh, 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 Joe Prospero work intensively on uh, uh, describing the long range transport uh, of dust from China, in one case, and also from uh, Sahara to Barbados, on the other hand. So, this was very helpful to the uh, scientific community to better understand the process. Next, please. Uh, why dust? Uh, somehow, uh, uh, Sarah already indicated, so I will not spend too much time on that one, just to list uh, the transport, agriculture, energy, health, climate, and weather are some of the uh, uh, activities or, or uh, 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 areas where mineral dust has uh, serious uh, uh, effects. Next, please. And as a result of the understanding of the importance of dust to the society, uh, you can see uh, how this was reflected in the number of publications uh, in uh, uh, recent until recent time, where there is really exponential growth of uh, uh, published uh, uh, evidence on, on dust in, in the scientific uh, community. Next, please. So, uh, Accumulated knowledge on SDS process uh, 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 forced us or led us to, to start uh, seriously to consider on a scientific and a practical way to develop uh, uh, first uh, uh, numerical weather prediction system with the added dust. Uh, this was a dream model example, the first one uh, for the Mediterranean uh, in the uh, 90s and uh, about the same time. Uh, colleagues in the uh, US Navy also uh, produced the first uh, global dust forecast. On the right hand side, you can see some examples on uh, uh, observations, but I will not spend too much time because uh, there are colleagues uh, uh, that will elaborate in more details this one. In any case, both modeling and observations are the key 
means for us uh, scientists to better understand and to predict and uh, analyze the dust storm, storm process. Next. So uh, as a result of uh, accumulated, as I said, uh, evidence on, on the scientific evidence on SDS, uh, uh, we started in 2005 after 46 uh, countries expressed uh, interest to participate in, in uh, such a project. Uh, uh, WMO established uh, the SDS was in 2007. Uh, as Sarah already indicated, and the mission was to enhance the ability of WMO members to deliver timely and quality sand and dust, uh, sand and dust on forecast, observations, uh, information, and knowledge to users through international partnership. That's a kind of complicated sentence, but this is really the basis of our activities within WMO. And uh, the, the whole system of SD was, uh, SDS was has both global and regional infrastructure. Next. Next, please. So uh, 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 at the moment, uh, this uh, global and regional structure is based act actually on activities of uh, four uh, regional node activities in SDS was this Asian, North African, uh, Middle uh, East, and Europe uh, NAMI node, Pan American, and uh, most recently, uh, Gulf Co Cooperation Countries uh, node is also established. And this is really extensive collaboration between the nodes, and also at the global level, we collaborate, uh, I, I would say, rather uh, uh, effectively. Next. And a uh, few words about the emerging issues, but I'm sure that uh, it will be more elaborated by colleagues that will present uh, after me. Uh, this is modeling and forecasting observations, as I already mentioned, but also we have to think about how uh, mineral dust affects uh, climate, uh, uh, then uh, different uh, activities like agriculture, health, transport, uh, uh, terrestrial interactions are also important. Important. So, this is, I think, more about the the uh, things that I wanted to say about SDS was. I guess that this is the last uh, 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 slide in in my presentation. Thank you. We cannot hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see that. I have to many things here. Sorry, yes, uh, I was saying thanks to Sarah and Nishko for this introduction. And now we are uh, <coughs> starting the new, the next uh, section from Science to Services. And our first speaker is Dr. Vasilis Amiridis for National Observatory Athens. And he will speak about that measurements. So Vasilis. Go Thank ahead. you, Ernest. I got intrigued by, by Nitschko's presentation, I did some research yesterday on the first measurements ever uh, reported. Next slide, if you can, Ernest. So the first in situ observations should be attributed to Homer Iliad in the 18th century BC, when Zeus set a rain of blood upon the earth. So this was actually a dust effect on the rain, right? So we had this actually was attributed to Zeus because in honor of his son, who Patroclus was about to kill during the Trojan War, right? So uh, mention here that uh, the red rain is perceived as blood rain, okay? And that researchers attributed this Iliad reference to the triumph of Sahara dust over Greece at that time. And it's very interesting that even today, some of the minerals, the names of the minerals show this effect. For example, hematite comes from the Greek word hema, which is the blood, right? So hematite is really related to the blood rain. And similar occurrences have been mentioned in other mythologies, such as the Indian Mahabharata, Chinese and Egyptian mythology, all regions within the dust belt, if you observe here. And there are some reports, of course, of blood rain also from outbreaks in Europe in the medieval period. You see here one in 1608, July in France. Next slide. 
So the blood ring phenomenon was first explained in 1800 by an Italian scientist, Giuseppe Maria Giovene, who actually observed a, a, a Sahara dust outbreak in Puglia region. Usually at that time, people believed that the rain was caused by the eruption of the volcanoes, Vesuvius and Etna around Italy in the same region. So Giovanni was the first one associated this phenomenon with the wind that preceded the rain and came to the conclusion that sun had been advected over the region from Africa. And then as Slobodan already mentioned, we have at 1832, South Darwin and the Beagle Cruise with dust samples. And from that point, to today, we have samples analyzed by electron microscopy, and now we know exactly what we see. Here you see an example by Candler's analysis of Saharan dust samples. Next slide, Ernest. Thank you. And from that to remote sensing, we can even measure now dust from distance. We have photometry. We have LIDARs with polarization capabilities, networks to observe the phenomena such as actress, and of course, photometry has been advanced a lot to have, next slide please, Ernest, also observations from space. This is the first image ever recorded by ESA 5 meteorological satellite in 7th of June of 1967, when a, a desert dust outbreak has been recorded and reported then by Prospero in his paper in 1970. Next slide. And for that, we have today High resolution and uh, multi wavelength measurements of desert dust from space, depicted also from uh, the multi spectral measurements uh, and the angstrom exponent, that it's actually a measure of size of the particles. And from that, we have an indication of the presence of dust, how dominant the dust a scene can be. But we also have other measurements of uh, features of dust that helps uh, discriminating dust from space, such as the absorption dependence on the wavelength which decreases with increasing wavelength and to use the use of this spectral dependence to see uh, dust affected regions from space but also the fact that dust particles are rich in silicate uh, it's actually a, a mean that we can use in remote sensing to use the silicate emission features in thermal spectra in order to identify dust and furthermore to use polarization capability to discriminate dust from space. We do that, for example, with LIDAR's depolarization profiles from space as Calypso or FKR. Next slide, Ernest. And this is just an example on how Calypso can provide, for example, by scatter extinction and concentration fields. We, we actually convert dust, we discriminate with the use of the polarization channel, and you see an integrated columnar value for the dust LD in the first plot. In the middle, you see how we separate the dust optical depth and how well this compares with the model retrievals, MERA in this case. Next slide. And how these products can be used to estimate, for example, the dust deposition over the Atlantic Ocean, in this case, from a DOMO study we do for ESA. Next slide and how the same profiles can be used in data simulation here is a study by bsc provided this plot by carlos and ensa how uh, these profiles from space actually improved the godzilla transport next slide and this is an ecmwf run where we try to see how errors affects the aerosol uh, assimilation affects nwp which is uh, actually, this is the difference in the wind from the control run. And you see differences up to two meters per second in regions affected by desert dust. And I think with that, the last slide, Ernest. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vasilis. It was the impressive evolution of uh, measurements. Uh, so now we have um, that's modeling of uh, Anna Bukovic from uh, the University of Belgrade is our chair, uh, the chair of uh, our note, of the NAMI note. So, Anna, if you are ready. Okay. Yes. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Ready.
so dust modeling actually includes the definition of dust sources to which the model performance is very sensitive uh, and uh, their dynamical nature related to weather and climate and human activities, which makes them more difficult uh, to predict their changes. Uh, then it includes uh, emission from the dust sources, vertical mixing and transport, uh, and uh, deposition, wet and dry deposition, and interaction of dust uh, uh, during its uh, life cycle in the uh, atmosphere with the environment. So development of, of such actually uh, complex uh, models, uh, because uh, dust models are fully coupled uh, with numerical weather prediction models uh, uh, now times, uh, they started uh, in uh, 1980s. Uh, so first results, for example, uh, were given in um, uh, a reference from Doug Westphal in 1988, uh, which is a very good uh, example at that time how precise synoptic analysis was done. Uh, uh, the drawing uh, of the events, uh, uh, analysis of the all reliable uh, available data to detect uh, the dust plums uh, and the weather conditions uh, and to find causes uh, and uh, to predict uh, uh, the, uh, the transport. Uh, so actually this uh, um, basically for nowadays simple simulations uh, gave very uh, good results, which, in, which initiated uh, uh, more rapid future developments uh, of the, uh, the modeling of the dust transport. Next slide. Uh, so this is also a uh, very uh, much used uh, reference uh, also in current papers uh, where we have this uh, uh, nicely given uh, one of the first uh, dust model schemes uh, uh, where different categories uh, of uh, dust uh, particle sizes are given and the global assessment of the, this, the global distribution of concentrations, uh, seasonal distribution, uh, then the distributions of optical thickness, uh, distribution by uh, of uh, uh, concentrations uh, by particle size categories. Uh, so as we can see in these early papers, uh, the goal was uh, actually to assess, is it possible to do such thing like uh, uh, modeling of the dust transport and uh, to retrieve uh, as much uh, knowledge as possible on the dust cycle in the Earth's atmosphere because there was no other way uh, because of the lack of observations. Uh, next slide. Uh, so after that, uh, there were uh, several papers worth to mention. They're just listed here. I will not uh, read them all. Uh, all uh, they appear also in the new uh, literature. So uh, these uh, research are very uh, with very uh, significant legacy, where uh, uh, which uh, actually contributed uh, uh, in physical representation of the emission of dust, which improved the results. Uh, then uh, appeared the uh, first integrated. Uh, uh, models for dust transport, which include a coupled model for surface wind erosion, model for surface processes, which included input database of relevant parameters on surface characteristics, and uh, all that coupled with numerical weather prediction model. Uh, then uh, several uh, global and regional models uh, developed. Uh, um, <clears throat> And also uh, in one reference uh, of Slobodan Nitschkovic, uh, there was the, uh, uh, actually the showcase of dust initialization approach using uh, satellite uh, data. Uh, there are also several papers uh, of further announcement of the regional modeling and uh, uh, papers uh, uh, almost 20 years uh, old uh, on the development of, of the Dream 8 uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, uh, development of the interaction of the dust with the environment and impact on the uh, temperature uh, made by uh, uh, Carlos and the crew. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, this is some, uh, let's say, older legacy, which is still valid uh, and uh, should be mentioned from time to time. Uh, and uh, this uh, knowledge uh, was very crucial uh, to enable further, further mod, uh, model uh, developments. Uh, in the recent uh, uh, two decades, especially in the last decade, there is a rapid uh, accelerated actually development of the uh, dust mo uh, modeling uh, because uh, uh, there's more observations, more, uh, uh, there is more available computer resources for these purposes. 
there is a, a larger modeling community engaged in dust modeling, uh, developed interdisciplinary collaboration to which uh, exceptionally contributed the cost action, uh, and uh, uh, the users are identified of the products uh, which uh, actually uh, bring dust modeling and forecasting uh, into the fo focus of the uh, potential user community. Uh, so uh, current developments uh, could be, you know, roughly divided uh, into development of the models uh, uh, to uh, include the uh, interaction of the dust with the environment and development of the models uh, to be able to predict the high resolution severe dust sources. Uh, in the uh, actually code uh, of the models, uh, if you go through the code, you will see that uh, dust is everywhere uh, uh, in the surface processes, uh, in the PBL processes, uh, free atmosphere processes, uh, in the physical uh, schemes of the, uh, in the uh, for uh, um, a creation of clouds, precipitation, uh, radiation budget, and so on and so on. Next slide, please. And a few more comments. Uh, the big turnout uh, in the model. Uh, inclusion of the Genou uh, source mask, uh, which is uh, the widely used uh, mask in the modeling community uh, from 2001. Uh, afterwards, uh, new uh, uh, source areas and uh, uh, were identified, uh, and uh, now also the knowledge about dust sources uh, is increasing rapidly. And uh, it is uh, found that uh, actually large portion of our uh, land surface on Earth uh, are uh, could produce sand and dust storms and uh, so recently are also def uh, defined besides the global dust belts also high latitude uh, dust belts next slide please uh, so improvements actually of dust modeling led to uh, what we now have multimodal ensemble regional warning system on FDS was in uh, in NAMI mode consists of 15 models uh, improved and uh, very much improved understanding of dust climate system interactions. Uh, here's uh, just an example of the recently published paper, uh, which uh, uses uh, different interaction of dust uh, with the environment in the atmosphere to assess the, uh, the impact on the climate. Uh, then in, uh, the in, uh, improvement of dust modeling, especially high resolution dust modeling, increased capacities to develop, develop early warning system for local severe dust events. And uh, uh, there are improvements in the initialization of dust forecast, development of the analysis of dust, and also increasing knowledge uh, uh, provided value information uh, to recognize the gaps and priority actions uh, for further improvements uh, of dust forecast quality and products. This is all from my side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this review, Anna. Uh, and now from modeling and measurements, we are going to start the impacts. So we have the health, that's impact on health with uh, Dr. Aurelio Tobias at the Spanish Council for Scientific Research. I think he's here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can switch on my camera, but I can, oh, okay. I think okay. that you can, you can hear me, yeah. So thank, thank you, you Aurelio, because you are in Japan right now, I think. So thank you again. So you can start. Oh, thanks, Ernest. So uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Ernest. Uh, just to to answer if the desert uh, dust impact uh, on human health is not an easy task. Uh, it first requires to clarify precisely what do we mean by health effects. In our context, the health effects are the changes in the health status resulting from the exposure to desert dust. And this can be uh, at the short term. I mean, the short term effects are those quantifying the acute impact on health after an immediate exposure to desert dust. While the long term effects refers to the chronic health effects derived from the prolonged exposure to desert dust. Unfortunately, most of the epidemiological evidence uh, comes from the short-term effects, and there is a lack of studies assessing for the long-term effects of desert dust. And on the other hand, by health impact, we refer to the evaluation of the potential health effects derived from the implementation of uh, public health policies to provide recommendation 
uh, for decision making that uh, will protect or may protect our health from desert dust uh, exposure. Uh, next slide, please. During the last uh, decade uh, the, in environmental epidemiology, we have been paying special attention uh, to, the, to the health effects of desert dust. However, the previous literature reviews only focus on specific regions and health outcomes. So from the WHO Techni Technical Advisory Group on Desert Dust and Health, we conducted a scoping review uh, to produce a broad overview of the existing uh, scientific literature uh, to identify the key concepts and highlight the knowledge gaps. Uh, this scoping review uh, was uh, published this year in the GeoHealth Journal, uh, where we review almost 200 epidemiological studies on the health effects of desert dust uh, in different regions. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, so half of the published studies uh, on the health, uh, they would, half of the uh, of the of the published studies, they uh, studied the health effects on Asian dust, and a quarter of these studies studied the health effects of uh, uh, Saharan dust, and they mainly use time series or case crossover studies. Almost eighty percent of the published studies reported adverse health effects of desert dust. The most reported health, ef uh, health effects associated with desert dust exposure in all the regions were an increase of the mortality risk due to cardio cardiovascular causes and an increase of hospital admissions due to respiratory causes. However, the exposure methods to identify and quantify dust events, and especially the metric definition for the desert dust exposure uh, varies substantially between studies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the framework uh, of the Indust uh, Cost Action, we propose a standardized methodology for epidemiological studies according to the desert dust exposure metric, which was published uh, a couple of years ago in the Epidemiology Journal. So when identifying uh, that, uh, those days affected by dust events, the epidemiologist is using a binary metric that allows to compare if the number of health events, uh, health events is larger on dust days compared to non-dust days. However, this simple approach does not account for the intensity of the dust event. As an alternative, we can focus on the association between particular matter uh, and health outcomes and here we can use the binary dust exposure to compare if the health effects of PM is larger on dust days compared to non-dust days. This approach has a, also the limitation that we cannot address for the source of the PM exposure. Instead, uh, we propose to use a continuous metric by identifying the PM sources to decompose between dust and non-dust I mean, local sources to next compare if the health effects if the health effects of the dust PM are larger than the health effects of the non-dust or the, the local PM sources. And uh, now under this approach, we are currently conducting a multi-country study with daily data uh, from uh, 21 cities, as far as I remember, in 10 or 11 countries affected by Saharan dust, Asian dust, and also in the Middle East. And we hope to present the results, uh, to get the results very soon and present them in, in, another, in another webinar. So this is uh, all from my part. Thanks, Ernest. Oh, thank you very much, Aurelio. So we're waiting for these results that you comment. So the next... No, uh, oh, yeah, you had a summary here. So the next um, sector affected by dust is solar radiation. Um, uh, we have uh, Dr. Estelioska Stasis from the Physical Meteorological Observatory in Davos uh, about solar radiation. So Estelios, uh, I can see you. So uh, you have the 
Florida. Thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the dust uh, and aerosol effects on solar radiation and mostly solar energy, that it's an application. And uh, my presentation in these five minutes, I will try to give an overview on dust effects on Earth's atmosphere and radiative balance. Uh, the solar radiation attenuation to solar energy fluctuations, the soiling, which is the dust deposition, the horizontal attenuation in the dusty environment, and also solar radiation and energy forecasting. Next one, please. Uh, uh, about the dust effects on Earth atmosphere radiative balance, we have this in this uh, seminars uh, very interesting presentation this year about uh, the direct radiative effect at the top of the atmosphere and also and also at the surface. And what we are interested in is to see how much uh, dust affects this uh, uh, this direct uh, radi that radiation. Uh, there was. Uh, in the recent five years, there are a lot of publications that uh, try to include uh, a lot of aspects of dust, like uh, sizes, bigger sizes, other optical properties that were assumed till uh, very recently. So the main thing is that the direct radiative effects for the top of the atmosphere is uh, in general negative, with uh, a positive effect of the coarse uh, dust and the negative effect of the fine dust. And also, again, positive and negative for long wave and short wave radiation. And uh, overall, it's uh, in overall it's uh, on the net it's negative. Uh, for the surface, it's also uh, the direct radiative effect. It's uh, negative for the short wave radiation and uh, positive for the longer radiation. But as you see here uh, in these presentations uh, in these papers that were presented also here in the seminars. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainty factors like the size and also the refractive index of dust. Next one, please. Uh, now about the solar radiation and energy, this is a map of uh, total uh, dust AOD from 2003 to 2017 from satellite data on the left. And then on the right, it's the global solar potential, the global horizontal radiance yearly potential. And you can see that uh, the area that is affected by dust is the one that has also the most solar potential or almost or the biggest area of solar potential at the planet. Next one, please. Now, before saying more about this, we have to think about the technologies that uh, are used now for uh, solar energy. It's the photovoltaics and also the concentrated solar power plants. And uh, photovoltaics, in terms of physics and the effect of aerosol, for example, is the solar radiation that comes from the direct beam and also the diffuse beam. So someone has to take into account both. And then for the concentrated solar plants, it's uh, mostly the direct irradiance or DNI, which is the one that is more, more, much more affected by aerosols. And also in this uh, concentrated solar power plants, someone has to include also the horizontal attenuation of, uh, of uh, uh, the radiation due to dust from the mirrors to the central, uh, let's say, tower, which, as you see in the picture, can be in the order of hundreds uh, of meters or more. Next one, please. <clears throat> Now, uh, there was uh, recently a publication about uh, the Mediterranean and uh, Southern Europe about the effect of uh, aerosols and dust in the last, uh, from 2003 to 2017. And here in the map, you can see the, on the left, the total aerosol and on the right, the dust effect of solar radiation in percent. It's uh, an hourly modeling using all the measurements of uh, dust uh, and other optical properties so far as well in these 15 years. And on the down, you can see the effect, up, you can see the effect of global horizontal irradiance. And then uh, in the bottom, you can see the effect of the direct normal irradiance. You can see that the effect of the direct normal irradiance is uh, uh, much more. It can reach, uh, on the average, uh, 30 to 40 percent in the North Africa. And also, the effect of the dust is also about uh, 35 percent uh, of that. In the next slide, uh, you can see this effect from year to year. These are three different domains. 
one it's uh, the, the northern uh, African part, uh, the second one is the middle, let's say Mediterranean, and then uh, southern Europe is the third one. And on the on the left you can see these three domains and the attenuation of dust, which is the uh, orange, uh, the total attenuation, which is the uh, total aerosol attenuation, which is the red, and the attenuation from other uh, aerosols other than dust aerosols, which is the green. And from uh, from year to year, you can see that the total attenuation from aerosols of solar radiation from DNA is in the order of thirty percent in the North Africa with fluctuation from year to year, and uh, 15 to 20% of that is due to dust. When you go to the northern, northern part, to D2 and D3, this attenuation of dust is less. Uh, you can see that it's reversed in D2, but it's still in the order of 10%, and in D3, it's in the order of 5%. And next one, please. Uh, then, uh, if we try to translate this to losses in solar energy. Here on the, on the left, you can see one very big dust event in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, with uh, attenuation of uh, the global horizontal irradiance uh, down to 40% and for the direct normal irradiance down to 90%. And uh, when someone wants to translate this to financial, let's say losses and aspects, you can see on the right, the attenuation, the average attenuation for Alexandria and Cairo for GHI and DNI from different sources for one year. And on the bottom right, you can see from a, a three day dust event how much this can be translated in economic losses from a certain, uh, certain PV or concentrated solar power plants that are operating there. Next one, please. Uh, there is also the problem of soiling or the dust deposition, uh, which is really important, especially in uh, inside the desert areas, but also everywhere. There are different models that try to simulate this. There was one very nice presentation in, in dust from DLR, Natalie Hanrader, that presented the DLR model that uh, has to do with sedimentation, Brownian motion, and uh, impaction. But the main thing is that uh, the soil reduces the solar transmit, and so more light is reflected, so less is absorbed by the panels. Uh, you can see one uh, how this affects the uh, concentrated solar power plants, the mirrors, and also the PV collectors on the middle bottom. You can see that the effect on the direct the, the mirrors it's much more. Within one month, it can be. 10% uh, reduction. This is for Evora Portugal. And uh, on the right, you can see how much is the effect uh, of this uh, non cleaning the panels uh, in the global scale. Uh, and this uh, CF factor, it's a factor that uh, gives more or less the, uh, the power generation that can be down from, from 0 0.2, for example, to Sahara down to 0 0.05. Uh, next one, please. Uh, just uh, this last slide about solar radiation forecasting and the aerosols. The thing here is that uh, solar forecasting is needed because of various reasons. And one is that uh, there is this energy market that someone needs to know how much uh, radiation someone will get in the next few hours, up to one or two days, in order to understand if. Uh, this uh, company or a private person or a country has to use this energy now or sell it or uh, store it. And this comes to different time scales for a few minutes to a few days. Uh, for hours of forecasting, one uh, very nice uh, source of data is the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service. And uh, that started also from uh, the ECMWF MAC project. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see one uh, comparison of this, uh, let's say, forecast with uh, RN data from a paper for uh, Mario Sede Hobside uh, that gives an impression of how well uh, this predi prediction worked back then. And then another uh, figure, it's on the right, uh, that shows that uh, CAMS works pretty well compared with uh, satellite data, but uh, loses. Uh, with the very big dust events that 
more or less uh, are masked. Uh, next one. I think this is it. Uh, a lot of things that were presented and discussed in this uh, cost action in dust that ended. And now there is the small uh, sister, let's say, of, or child of in dust. It's harmonia, which has to do with some photometric measurements of fires or that it's ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stelios. It was a great review. So the last speaker of this section is uh, Dr. Lucia Mona, uh, Italian Research Council, and uh, she will uh, speak about the user experience, uh, how we can uh, fill the gap between, between scientists, community, and users. So Lucia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Ernest, and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I will talk about interaction with users, and uh, this is a really important topic because, as shown before, nowadays we have a lot of data that can be of interest for um, addressing the different impact of the dust. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of data that should be translated into useful information for the different user, user communities. So what we have nowadays is something like different groups. So observational groups of people, modeling people, and then different user communities. Different user communities that has and use, make use of different vocabularies, different approaches. And uh, they should have, they have different needs, different languages, because dust, as Sarah and Nitschko say, is a global problem. And so we have different languages and different education and cultures around. So all these kind of things should be addressed and barriers should be uh, reduced in the, the communication between the, the researchers and the user communities. And uh, all the discussion should tend to abate these kind of uh, barriers. Next, please. So how to do this? We gained a lot of expertise during the in-dust cost action that was mentioned many times already. Um, the point is having a wide group of people involved in these activities uh, about uh, connection with the users. And this for sharing and distributing the work in such a way that there are different contact points for the different, let's say, uh, impacts, but also for the, uh, covering the different cultural aspects and, uh, and uh, regional aspects. And also to link these user-driven uh, activities with the dissemination activities, because dissemination activities give the possibility to um to be in touch with other new and not expected user uh, potential users so which are the key actions toward the user first of all identifying the potential mm -hmm. users understanding how much they know about scientific capabilities collecting requirements go back to the science for tailoring the products and then check the satisfaction level of the users and this is really important for having um, an efficient uh, connection with users. Next, please. In practice, how to do that? The, the means for doing that are workshops, so considering um, sector, sectorial workshop or having people involved there, but also build a trust relationship between scientific community and users. And so we, through one-to-one -one interaction. And the action to be done in this kind of uh, uh, activities, interaction with the users are showing different user-oriented solution for understanding which is the best solution, um, discussing gaps, because this can also driven to new science making uh, some brainstorming for new ideas and so uh, fostering progresses in science and uh, in um, um, resilience and uh, actions for mitigating the impacts and also further tailoring the actions. So I just want to show you how we um, 
this process has been done for one of the impacts mentioned before by Sarah. Uh, this is just an image in, of a photo of uh, an airport under this uh, event. Uh, for the aviation, there could be some mechanical problems to the engine, and these are due to ice nucleation and so the formation of big particles uh, with the ice around. And then uh, the dust melting because of the high temperature in the turbines, but also abrasion uh, processes of the, of the aircraft and the turbine. And this can uh, reduce the lifetime of the, of the vehicle but also problems related to reduction of visibility that can uh, make uh, some effects on the airport operation. So for takeoff and landing and also closing airports and uh, um, reducing and cancellation of flights. So these are the impacts. So next, please. Uh, this is one example of tailored product for aviation. Vasilis already mentioned the actress uh, Arzo remote sensing activities. This is a map of the station over Europe and are reported on left and right uh, some standard orient actress products, uh, which are temporal and vertical evolution of particle back curves, particle back scatter coefficient, and particle depolarization ratio. Nice scientific product. But for the user, we should translate these data into information of interest for them. Next, please. So we add interaction with uh, um, pilots, with ATM, with SSR, with VAX, and meeting were done also at national continental level for a direct uh, interface with them. And so we got requirements about uh, needs for vertical resolution information, plus easy to be read from not export and near real-time provision for assessing um, the, um, the, the, the presence of dust in the near real time. Next, please. And so this kind of product came out from this interaction with the users. So we moved from scientific data to information from the user for the users. And this kind of process is really important for phasing user needs. Next, please. Another example of tailored product is reported here. It comes from a reanalysis model. So it means long-term uh, available data uh, with high uh, special temporal coverage. And so we have a lot of data, but for, for addressing impacts on the aviation, uh, it was found these two products, which are about aircraft safety. So having an estimation of the dust exposure at cruise level for 10 years. And so, for example, here on the left, you can see in the blue region, the, 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 the portion of the flight where the, the, the exposure is not too high, while you can see different colors for higher exposure to, to at the cruise level. And on the right, uh, a product for traffic management, so showing uh, the annual probability of having uh, an exceedance of um, uh, the visibility, let's say a uh, low threshold in the visibility. And so where you can have problems uh, related to the flight rules. And this is just one example for uh, impact uh, on aviation. And it is based on the product that we have now, but uh, this kind of process of interaction with users and feedback with them uh, will for sure address also uh, and make use of new data. And uh, so I think this is really uh, linked with uh, the new uh, perspective that Carlos and Pavla will show right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lucia. Thank you for introducing the next section. This is the looking at the, the future. We have uh, Dr. Carlos Perez uh, and Paula Daxon, Dr. Paula Daxon uh, from Agricultural University of Iceland, uh, and Carlos Perez from uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I think we are just five minutes behind our schedules, but so feel relaxed. Go ahead. 
So for the interest of time, this will be very, very short uh, because we only have three minutes left. So <clears throat> I have highlighted here what I think are five of the of the key challenges that uh, that we face. Uh, these are general, very general challenges. Um, so we still have, uh, despite the advances that we had in the last uh, decades, we still have a poor understanding of some some key physical processes controlling dust aerosols. Uh, and of course, at different uh, spatial and, and temporal scales for different applications or for climate and, and weather scales, regional and global. We still have a lack of reliable dust information in many countries, and in particular those that are affected by, by sun and dust storms. Uh, there are uh, still large uncertainties for certain types of episodes on forecasts uh, on time scales from days to a week. Uh, and uh, particularly mentioning habubs, uh, so like mesoscale events. Uh, we have a severe lack of knowledge and capabilities uh, for long range run dust prediction. There are basically no uh, capabilities or you know known capabilities for long range dust prediction. I'm talking about months to decades. Um, and also, of course, uh, I, I haven't put it here, but for projections, uh, um, centennial projections, we have still many difficulties, for example, to reproduce the 20th century for dust. So we are not able to reproduce that with physical models. Uh, so we cannot rely on our projections towards the future. So, and then finally, there's very limited integration still, uh, despite advances, of course, of dust information and forecasts into what you could call practice and policy. Uh, so we start seeing, you know, connections between dust and dust forecasts and data, you know, with solar radiation applications, uh, health, transportation, but but this is very far still from being something that is kind of adopted operationally that you know impact models and dust models are really well connected etc so there's a lot of space for improvement in the next years on that uh next slide yeah so without going into details constraining the dust cycle uh and its effects upon climate remains a, a key challenge in in many aspects I will not go into detail of this slide because I have no time, but basically all these processes that describe the dust cycle and its effects, they are full of challenges, scientific challenges, from the emission of dust uh, to its processing and aging in the atmosphere to its deposition, uh, like and then on impacts like at different time scales, ocean fertilization, snow, uh, ice albe albedo, their effects on radiation and cloud microphysics, in particular ice clouds, for example. And then all these feedbacks at, at short and long term time scales, uh, together with uh, with together with uncertainties in in other forcings and uncertainties that we have still in the human disturbances to dust sources. So uh, this, I think, clearly highlights, you know, that still we have we have a lot of uh, work ahead. Next slide. Uh, and this is my last slide before I give the floor to Pavla. Um, so these are some examples of key challenges in representing the dust cycle, particularly from the modeling perspective. Uh, we still um, um, have a lot of problems to um, to represent emission despite advances. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to balance dust schemes at global scale, consistently, physically based. Uh, uh, partly the problem is that we lack uh, like data sets for roughness, vegetation, and soil moistures. Um, we also uh, lack, uh, and of course, you know, we are we're working towards that, but we lack uh, data mineralogy, soil textures, and sizes of the soils, of the particles in the soils. Then uh, we uh, we also struggle to describe well the size distribution at emission. Um, we don't represent well wind, uh, so wind gas and haboobs, particularly in global models and for climate applications, but also for forecasting, still something that we were not able to do because typically forecasts are uh, working at the resolutions that are too coarse still. Um, coarse dust is another key challenge. Uh, you know, we're starting to see a lot of work in that direction. I think, uh, you know, it's very promising direction and because it, it can really affect on, on downstream on many applications, particularly soil radiation and soiling uh, close to desert sources, for example. Uh, the shape optical properties and, and, and the size of the particles, it's a challenge both for the observations and the models. And then, as I said before, long-term variability. So now it's your turn, Pavla. 
Thank you, Carlos. So I have a very short slide here. So today on this important day, I would like to emphasize that the sand and dust storms occur also at high latitudes. And indeed, there has been also another northern dust belt identified in the uh, sand and dust source base map. And uh, there is also a new publication showing that uh, we have actually over 70 evidence um, location at high latitudes where sand and dust storms occur. And for the high latitude dust networks, I would like to say that there are at the moment two active networks. One is the Icelandic Aerosol and Dust Association, which is a member association of the European Aerosol Assembly, and then the Arctic thematic network on high latitude dust. There are existing now two high latitude dust uh, models uh, providing uh, operational forecast. One is the Dream Iceland for Icelandic dust storms and deserts and the uh, Finnish SILA model. And the uh, active uh, groups are measuring in situ in these harsh conditions. And these uh, groups are in um, Iceland, Canada, Greenland, and Antarctica. And uh, some shorter measurements also occur in Alaska, Svalbard, Patagonia, and other locations. And the last sentence is that uh, when we talk about the climate impacts of the dust, these are very important areas. The polar regions are uh, experience the mo most abrupt changes when it comes to uh, increasing temperature and environmental changes. And this is where the dust comes from. So, so it's a close interaction between the deserts and uh, cryosphere. Thank you. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, thank you, Paula and Carlos, uh, for this uh, uh, looking at the future section. So many things, new things are, are waiting for us. Uh, we have this last uh, section of questions. Uh, uh, Mark Parrington is a uh, uh, senior scientist at CAMS. And I don't know, Mark, if you have any questions, a couple of questions, maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I, thanks, no, yes, sorry, um, in the interest of time, I think a lot of the questions that we had in the Q&A have, have been answered by, by different people. Um, so the questions have covered the, uh, the health impacts of the, the transmission of viruses, including COVID-19. Uh, a question on the, on the, um, sorry, I have to read it where I go. Uh, there's one on um, with advances of uh, dust modeling and forecasting to identify what the important area areas are to focus in the future. Um, and also um, information on the, the radiation dust interactions. So um, again, Stelius has answered these in the chat. Um, so I think we'll, we'll try and keep a record of these and, and share them with the attendees. Um, at some point, but um, but yeah, there's been, there's been some good questions, and um, uh, yeah, so thanks for the to the attendees for posting those. And um, if there's any further, I, I think there's always channels of communication that more questions can be asked to the to the experts in this panel. Okay, uh, so well, uh, we are well, almost in time, so. I want to thank all the, all the speakers because they have prepared all the slides in a, in a record time. Uh, but I think it was a great way to celebrate this uh, new day, this International Day of Combating Sun and Dust Storm. And I don't know, Sara, or maybe Sloan, do you want to say something to finish this? Thanks, Pierre. Uh, uh, actually, yes. yes. I, I would like to share the information uh, uh, to the community. Uh, uh, last year, WMO launched the idea uh, to develop uh, a text uh, 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 or publication uh, uh, titled as WMO uh, Methodology of SDS Forecasting and Assessment to provide services to users. We already uh, mentioned during this uh, session uh, strong need to get closer to users as, as data producers. So uh, this text is uh, already uh, available. This is under the uh, re uh, revision uh, uh, phase. And I hope that it will be important to WMO 
publication uh, edited by the end of, of, of the year, hopefully. So uh, the authors are uh, Anna Vukovic Vimic, uh, 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 myself, and uh, uh, oh my God, uh, our chair. Daniel, Daniel Tong. Yes, uh, that's right, Daniel Tong. So uh, that's from my side. I don't like to take more time. I don't know if someone else wants to say something, but uh, from United Nations perspective, I can tell you that the sun and dust community, atmospheric research community is one of the most active and, and you are amazing to organize all the events that you organized today. I can tell you that I, I had to run from one to the other. Also, Ernest was collaborating and Anna in different events today. Then just I want to say that also these days for celebrating all your achievements as community, as research community, there are many papers that you produced the last years as a community, like one that is almost uh, been uh, published, that is this nice uh, dust observations uh, review led by Lucia here, but there are all, many others. Also, there are many projects that are aligned with the objective of the SDS was, and thanks to you, we are putting on the agenda the, the priority research lines that should be addressed in the next years. Then uh, you have to be proud to be this, uh, from this community and don't leave your, 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 your energy on this project because the future is, is getting very interesting for all of you and for all of us. Okay, thank you, Sara. Thank you, Nisko, and uh, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. So let's uh, finish here this uh, uh, this day. This uh, so uh, have a nice dusty uh, day. So <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Next year, same hour, same date. <laughs> yes, exactly. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye.